Well, it's a very great pleasure for us this evening to say hello to an up-and-coming Merseyside group, the Beatles. And I know their names, and I'm going to try and put faces to them. Now, you're John Lennon, aren't yes, you? Yes, that's right. What do you do in the group, John? I play harmonica, rhythm, guitar, and vocal. Mm-hmm. That's what they call it. Harmonica, rhythm, guitar, and vocal. Then there's Paul McCartney, that's yeah, you. Me, yeah. And what do you do? Play bass, guitar, and uh, sing, <laughs> I think. Oh, you know, that's, that's what they quite say. Quite apart from being vocal. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 <laughs> then there's George Harrison. Mm, how do you do? How do you do? Mm. What, what's your job? Uh, lead guitar and sort of singing. Mm-hmm. By playing lead guitar, does that mean you're sort of leader of the group, or are no, you...? No, no, just... Well, you see, the other guitars, the rhythm. Yeah. Ching, ching, so ching, you It's solo yeah. guitar, you see. John and is, in fact, the leader of the group. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether we caught that or not, but uh, I hope it went in. And over in the background here, and also in the background of the group, but making a lot of noise, is Ringo Starr. Hello. You're new to the group, aren't you? Yes, um, nine weeks now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Were you in on the act when the recording was made? Yes, I'm on the record. I am. It's down on record, you know. (laughs) Now, um, I'm the drummer. (laughs) What's that offensive weapon you've got there? Those are your drumsticks. Well, it's um, just a pair of sticks a fan of just bought me, you know, because we're going away, and they put my name on. And it's Uh, good, you know. Well, you say you're going away. That leads us on to another question. Now, where are you going? Germany, Hamburg. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, you have... Two weeks. Standing in great engagements over there, haven't you? Well... The boys have been there quite a lot, you know, and I've been there with other groups, but this is the first time I've been there with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Well, Paul, you tell us, how did you get in on the act in Germany? Well, it was all through an old agent. We first went there for, <laughs> for uh, a fellow who used to manage us, and Mr. Alan Williams of the Jacaranda Club in Liverpool, and he found the engagement, so we sort of went there, and then went under our own steam, steam. <laughs> as they say afterwards, you know. Mm-hmm. And we've just been going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. <laughs> You're not dizzy at all? Well, yes, actually, yes. yes, yes. It's, my, it's my left leg, you know, the war. <laughs> <laughs> George, um, were you um, brought up in Liverpool? Yes, oh, ah, yes. Uh, whereabouts? Well, born in Wavertree and bred in Wavertree and speak. Mm-hmm. Well, the aeroplanes are, you know, yes, yeah. you know, the aeroplanes. Uh, yeah. Are you all Liverpool types, then? Yes. Uh, yeah. Types, oh, yes. Yeah. Liverpool types. <laughs> now, I'm told that you were actually in the same form as young Ron Witcherly, now... Ronald, yes. Yes, now Billy Fury. In St. Silas. In which? St. Silas. Really? Yes, I'm sure it was. Now, it was. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't in Gilvey, like you said, in the Musical Express. Oh. No, that was no, wrong. that was uh, a mm. wrong St. Price. Silas School. Oh, I mean, well, now, I'd like to introduce, if I may, a young disc jockey who uh, helps us out with programmes at Cleaver and Catterbridge Hospitals. His name is Malcolm Threadgill. He's 16 years old, and I'm sure you'd like to ask some questions from the teenage point of view, Malcolm. Yes, thank you. Um, I understand you've made uh, other recordings before on German label. Yeah. Is that right? What ones were they? Well, we did make... Uh, made, first of all, we made a recording with a fellow called Tony Sheridan. We were working at a club called the Top Ten Club in Hamburg, and we made a recording with him called My Bonnie, which got to number five in the German hip parade, but <laughs> it never, it didn't do a thing over here. You know, it was, uh, it wasn't a very good record, but so the Germans must have liked it a bit, you know. And we, oh, <laughs> begging your pardon. And we did uh, an instrumental which was released in France on an LP, uh, on an EP of Tony Sheridan's, which George and John wrote themselves. So that didn't, that wasn't released here. We've got one copy, that's all. You know, it didn't do anything. Uh, you composed um, P.S. I Love You and um, Love Me Do yourself, didn't you? Yeah. Who, who, com- who does the composing well, between you? Well, it's John and I. We write, you know, sort of the songs between us. Yeah. It's, you know, we've, we've sort of signed contracts and things to say that, you know, if we sort of... Shares. Yeah, equal yeah. shares and royalties and things, so that... You know, really, we just both write most of the stuff. George did write this instrumental, you know, as we say. But mainly it's John and I. We've written about, over about a hundred songs, but we don't use half of them, you know. We just happened to sort of rearrange Love Me Do and played it to the recording people and P.S. I Love You. And uh, they seemed to quite like it, you know, so that's what we recorded. Mm-hmm. And that was Paul McCartney telling you all about it. Mm-hmm. Is there any more of your own um, compositions you intend to record? Then? Well, we we did record another song of our own when we were down there, but it wasn't wasn't finished enough. 
So, no, we'll take it back next time and see how they like it then. Yeah. Well, that's all on my end. <laughs> well, thank you for asking the questions, Martin. Um, now, I would, in closing, I would like to just ask you, um, we're recording this at Hume Hall, Port Sunlight. Did, you, uh, did any of you... <coughs> I'll start again in English. Yeah. <laughs> did any of you come over this side before you became famous, as it were? Do you know this mm. district? Well, famous, you know. If, <laughs> if being famous has been in the hip parade, well, we've been over here... Uh, we were here about two months ago. Been here twice, haven't we? I've got relations, relations here, yeah. Rock Ferry. Have you? Yes. Oh, all sides of the water, you know. Mm. Yeah, I've got a relation in uh, Clawton Village, yes. Upton Road. I was a friend in Birkenhead. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had. I know a man <laughs> in Chester. <laughs> now, that's a very dangerous thing to say. There's a mental home there, mate. Um, well, never mind. Peter, uh, Peter, Smether, Peter Smethurst is here as well. I'll get my right teeth in. <laughs> yeah, okay. And he looks as though he's bursting to say a question. Yeah, well, there's just one question I'd like to ask you. I'm sure it's the question everyone's asking me. I like your impressions on first appearance on television. Well, you know, strangely enough, we thought we were going to be dead nervous, and everyone said, you suddenly, when you see the cameras, you realise that there are two million people watching, because there were two million watching that, people in places that we did, we heard afterwards. But, you know, strangely enough, it, it didn't, you know, it didn't come to us, we didn't think at all about that, and it was much easier doing the television than it was doing the radio, it's still nerve-wracking, but it was a little bit easier than doing radio because there was a full audience for the radio broadcast. Do you find it nerve-wracking doing this now? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we hope we've got a full audience in uh, both hospitals, Clatterbridge and Cleaver, and over at Cleaver Hospital, uh, a certain record on Parlophone, the top side has been requested for Eileen in Robert Cock Ward from Maddy, and strangely enough for Maddy from Eileen in the same ward, so perhaps the Beatles themselves would like to tell them what it's going to be. Yeah, well, I think it's going to be Love oh, Me Do. Oh, yeah. oh, four, nine, four, nine. <laughs> <laughs> love Me Do. Quiet, folks. Yeah. And I'm sure from them it, it, the answer is P.S. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Charlie Lennon is a caring, compassionate friend of Beatle fans everywhere, always ready to sit down with Beatle people and talk about the good old days with his brother Fred and young John. He is that rarest of all creatures in the phenomenal world of Beatledom, a genuine eyewitness to the formation of a legend. Here he sings an original ballad beckoning back to the first bygone days of Beatlemania in Liverpool. ships of the mercy that sailed away from the shores they have been and gone and left us never to return no more oh come back to the mercy to the sounds of twist and shout we'll keep the world Of that there is no doubt The live a bird is silent It's got nothing to shout about It's seen the ships come in each day And it's seen them all go out But now those days are over they were the scenes of the past Now all the live virgins these days Is the chimes of the live clock Father Tom McKenzie, an early Beatles compere in Liverpool, recalls the unqualified madness that was Beatlemania. 
I'll, I'll go back into 62. When the uh, boys started doing the first numbers and, and they hadn't done Love Me Do or Please Please Me then, they were doing the, the uh, My Bonnie Twist and Shout. The girls found out that Ringo, they found out he liked jelly babies, these sweets. and They used to bring these sweets and throw them on the stage in the bags <laughs> for Ringo. In these, uh, these shows that they were throwing the jelly babies, when we pulled the curtains and they went off stage, John used to come on, on stage and he'd say, give me a hand with these. Now, there was only one young lady we let on stage, and she was a polio case in a wheelchair. And due to being in the hall, she couldn't see at the back. We used to bring her through the back end and put her on the stage. And John and I used to throw out and put all these jelly babies in her lap. You know? And he used to think the world of them. I had to get to the hall for, to do the dance. And they got in the hall about half past seven, soaking wet. And the ladies go on the stage. The hall was packed out. Every ticket had been sold, and there was thousands standing outside in the lane, just in the shelter of the hall, listening to the lads playing and the girls screaming. Because hysteria used to break out in those days. The girls, when they started doing Please Please Me for Me to You, uh, the hysteria of the girls shouting... I love George, I love John, and they'd throw notes on the stage. These are the things I used to collect. There was um, a relative of Ingo's lived in Northwich, and they'd gone there for the dinner, so they wanted something to eat, and they couldn't go into the canteen, into the cafeteria, count of the kids, you know, mobbing them, see. So they went to this relative's. So... I used to go into the dressing room, make sure everything was okay and that. And I went into the dressing room. There was two big dressing rooms. And I went, I went into one, this one that the Beatles were in. And I saw the toilet door move. So I just pushed this out. And I could feel it with some of the eyes. I, like, come on, let's have you out. And five girls <laughs> swooped out. Now, the only way those girls could get in, and I noticed, was a toilet, little toilet window half open. One girl had climbed up a spout two stories high and got through that window and opened the window and all the others had climbed up the drain pipe and, and got it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the lads knew I was quite sick, but they, they went to the rules. And uh, there's another thing about them. I never even saw them smoke. All these stories later on about John and Paul smoking, and that, I, I never even saw one of them smoke. Not one. Anyhow, um, they'd got to the top with Please Please Me from Michio, and I was at Buxton Pavilion. Now, it was a very low stage. It was a big round dome, but it went into a bottleneck, where they like pushing all the people into that, you see, follow them in, this is all round. And I saw a girl go down, swaying like anything. And I, I jumped off the stage, grabbed her, also on stage and it shows me pinging around and, and with, the, with the police sergeants on stage and the Beatles playing behind me, you know. I spoke to Cavern Club announcer Bob Wooler about his memories of Brian Epstein and the Beatles during a 1983 interview in the Fab's hometown of Liverpool. And I met the Beatles. Now, I didn't know them really, but I knew the drummer. This drummer was Tommy Moore. Now, he used to work at Garston Docks on the railway with me. He was older than the Beatles, and he did suffer at the hands and he came, of the Beatles, especially John Lennon and Paul McCartney. My fourth meeting with them was in the Jacaranda in December 60, where I met two Beatles in the Jacaranda. And they explained to me that they had been to Hamburg and this and the other had happened. So I was then with a promoter called Brian Kelly and I said, uh, half an hour spot at Litherland Town Hall as an, as an extra. And they agreed to it and we fought over the fee with what, Kelly. What was it? Well, I asked Brian Kelly for eight pounds and he collapsed uh, and he said four pounds. I said, well, there's five of, uh, there were five Beatles, you see. Actually, Neil Aspinall was a kind of Beatle. He drove them around. Anyway, after a lot of argy-bargy, it became six pounds. 
Now, uh, because I was handling that show, the order of the groups, I was able to give them a very good spot. Not a, an early spot, you see, and not a late spot. I gave them a, a middle-of-the-bill spot. And, of course, they were, they transfixed the audience, and that was the beginning of what was later to be coined, not by me, as Beatlemania. Now, of all the Beatles, Stuart Sutcliffe, we used to talk, not just rock and roll, we used to talk about films, books, uh, paintings. He was, a, as you appreciate, he was quite a painter. Well, it, it was really more close to his heart than the, the guitar was, the music. Uh, uh, Stuart wasn't a meek and mild person, you know. He, he could be quite uh, verbally aggressive. So he used to stick up for himself, because uh, John, when he was in the mood, and Paul, uh, they used to shout him down, you see. It wasn't a falling out. It was simply uh, an establishment of... Uh, uh, of position, of uh, pecking order. Now, uh, lots of things had happened to them, because Epstein was uh, with them, and lots of uh, glowing things uh, were going to happen to them. And in a way, they were rather full of that. Uh, in other words, they had rather got out of any emotional feelings for Stuart by then. They'd been uh, coming and going between uh, Liverpool and London. They'd been away on tours around the country. Throughout 63, uh, they actually departed Lock, Stock and Barrel from Liverpool at the end of 63, when uh, Epstein uh, set up a shop in London where all the publishers and television people are really and of course he was preparing for your fab 64 invasion they had been extremely big in this country but they rather swept the significance of kennedy's death in this country so it seemed a logical step that america would take to them but, of course, I had no idea that the America would be uh, swept off its feet. I always Lennon's complained, and George Harrison was always concerned about uh, his guitar breaks, you see. Uh, and they, Paul McCartney used to say, go through the motions, and they, indeed, they, that's all they did. A veritable giant of a man, Calvin Club doorman Paddy Delaney spoke to me about his days with the Beatles back in Liverpool in 1983. Here's what he had to say. Well, um, their appearance on the scene uh, occurred on the 21st of March, 1961. And the first one I saw was George Harrison, who ambled down the street. And um, in them days... Her styles were very strict and very tidy, as it's worn by teddy boys. His hair was um, lank, hanging down onto his uh, collar. He was very scruffy, that's our word for it in this country. He looked very trampish and very hungry looking. He ambled down the middle of the street and um, for a moment, I didn't think he was coming into the Cavern Club, but uh, I stopped him and um, asked him if he was a member. And uh, I knew he wasn't, but I know that I'd stop him anyway. But he said, no, he was with the Beatles. And I knew the Beatles were on that particular night. I couldn't do anything about it. I just had to let him in. But what I did notice, he was wearing jeans. And um, we'd banned, well, I'd banned jeans from the club. About 15 minutes later, Paul McCartney ambled down the street with uh, John Lennon in close pursuit. Paul McCartney was carrying his bass guitar. John Lennon, hands dug deep in his pockets, ambled after him. And um, I had an idea that they might have been the same because he had the same sort of hairstyle. I let them in. And I, a while afterwards, a taxi came down the street and... It, Sitting in the back was this chap um, I later knew was, as uh, Pete Best. He was carrying the Beatles' uh, two speakers. 
he had his set of drums, series of wires and everything, and um, took him downstairs and he paid the taxi. Now this is how the Beatles arrived, first of all, at the Cavern Club. In later years, when I saw groups arriving at the Cavern Club with, um, like, big furniture removal vans, two of them, and about ten men running around moving equipment for four or five people, I realized that the Beatles actually came from nothing. They came from the earth. And it also matched their music. The music was earthy. Also, the, the animal magnetism that they had, they, it was all, uh, all encased in that one particular moment. They had this thing that, uh, if you don't like me, it's just too bad. Uh, I'll say no more about it, but I'll tell you this. I saw the gradual build-up from that first meeting up to the stage where a toilet roll was passed down a queue near the height of the Beatles' fame, but he went to America. Passed right down, uh, the queue went right down Matthew Street, right round the corner, and there was five, maybe five, maybe half a dozen times more than we'd be able to get in the club. And I knew it was my sad duty to turn them away. But I've seen them holding all sorts of objects, all depicting um, requests. And one of the most outstanding requests I ever saw that happened to get into the club, a toilet roll signed from the very beginning, unrolled, gradually went down the queue and signed by everybody just for one number. Absolutely nobody in show business before, during, or since knew how to talk to the press like the Beatles did. With the sole exception of perhaps the Marx Brothers, the Beatles were incredibly witty and refreshing. Although it's all incredibly rare archival material, the Beatles' magic shines through. Here's a press conference in Hollywood to start things off. One question we like in Hollywood, would like to know how you compare movie working to, say, the concert tour or recording sessions. Well, we don't compare it much. You know. uh, would you rather play the Hollywood Bowl again than Dodger Stadium? We don't really mind. Maybe we can um, start another controversy here. One of your countrymen was here yesterday or the day before, before he returned to England, or on his arrival in England. He said he thought uh, American women were out of style for not wearing mini skirts, and that they're, because they didn't wear mini skirts, their legs were ugly. Uh, I'd like to ask you what you think about American women's legs. Well, if they don't wear the mini skirts, how does he know their legs are ugly? <laughs> we'll be... You know, on your uh, album cover that was banned here, first of all, whose idea was it? And second of all, what was it supposed to mean from your standpoint? What's he say? Can you say that again? <laughs> yeah. You know, the album cover that was banned here, you know, oh, yeah. with the dolls and the meat, whose idea was it? And yeah, what? The photographers who took it. John, why did you decide to make How I Won the War, minus the other Beatles? Because um, uh, he just asked me. You know, and I just said yes. <laughs> it was just like that. <laughs> Do you uh, consider that now, uh, since you've been in the United States here for almost a week, that this religious issue is answered once and for all? Would I you clarify so. and repeat it, uh, the answer that you gave you in Chicago? I can't yeah. repeat it again because I don't know what I said, you know. Well, would you clarify the you remarks read, that were attributed you know, to you? You tell me what you think I meant, and I'll tell you whether you, I agree or... Well, some know. of the remarks attributed to you in uh, some of the newspapers, the press here... Uh, said that uh, concerning the remark that you made comparing the relative popularity of the Beatles with Jesus Christ and that yeah. the Beatles were more popular. This created quite a controversy and a furor in this country, <coughs> as you are obviously aware. Do you know that, John? Now, uh, would you uh, clarify the remark? Well, I've clarified it about 800 times, you know. I could have said TV or something else, you know, and that's as clear as it can be. I just use Beatles because I know about them a bit more than TV. I could have said any number of things. Wouldn't have got as much publicity, though. <laughs> my, question, my question is directed at all of you. Do you think this, uh, this controversy has hurt your careers or has helped you? 
professionally. Obviously, you're quite aware of it. It hasn't helped or hindered it, I don't think. I think most sensible people took it for what it was. And it was only the um, bigots that took it up and thought it was, you know, on their side. They thought, ha-ha, here's something to get them for. But when they read it, uh, they saw that, you know, there was nothing wrong with it, really. It's just that they thought that by us saying, uh, by John saying that we were more popular than Jesus, they thought, ah, you know, he's bound to be arrogant. And... Did you see the fellow on telly last night? He said it. Tonight show. Sure. John, what stimulates you in your work? I just said anything, you know. And also, what's your favorite group in the U.S.? Favorite what? Group in the United States. I've got a few, you know, birds, spoonful, mamas and papas, I suppose. Beach on that side of it. Beach and boys? miracles, etc. on the other side of it. Uh, my question concerns uh, money. Uh, I was wondering if you still have an arrangement with the U.S. Internal Revenue Department to pay your taxes to England through them. Another part of uh, the question is, how much money have you grossed in your current U.S. tour, and is it true that oh. you lost... We don't know money has got nothing we don't to know do about this. that. You know, we don't do the money side of it, you know. Uh, Brian does that. And we don't particularly worry tell about tell us it. what we get in the end. <laughs> the uh, tax... Thing. We pay tax and things, but we don't know how much or how much we've made or anything, you know, because uh, if we were going to worry about that, we'd be nervous wrecks by now. I'd like to direct this question to Messrs. Lennon and uh, McCartney. In uh, a recent article, Time Magazine put down pop music, and they referred to uh, Day Tripper as being about a prostitute oh, yeah. and Norwegian Wood about, as being about a lesbian. Oh, yeah. Now, I just wanted to know what... What your intent was when you wrote it, and what sh what your feeling is about the Time magazine criticism of the music that is being written today? We were just trying to write songs about prostitutes and lesbians, that's all. <laughs> Do you have it? Will you be working separately in the future, or together? Pardon? It's all together, probably. Together, aren't uh, John Lennon? Aren't you doing the picture alone? Yeah, but I mean that's only in the holiday bit, you know. I see. In between Beetle. Fred Paul from KASK. First of all, I'd like to say hi to you all again. It's hi, really Fred. good to see hi. you. And so, <laughs> yeah, <there's laughs> go on, Fred. I'd like go to on, ask man. a question that you've never been asked before. Oh, no. What are you going to do Ooh, when the bubble oh, bursts? <laughs> Uh, well, Fred. You know, that's well, a personal in-joke. He used to ask it at every press conference we went to, to keep the party going. Do you think we'll have another tour again next year? Ask Could be, Brian. Fred. Could, Could be. be. Brian does that. Thank you very much. He does a lot okay, of it, Fred. Fred. <laughs> Outside in Hollywood tonight, you had to arrive in an armored truck, and the truck was swarmed by adoring fans. What is the situation wherever you go? Do you ever have a uh, an opportunity to walk out in the street without being recognized or can you walk into a, a theater to see a movie by yourself if you What's go and the lights are down you can go in. we can do that in england it's easier in england than it is here and it's mainly because we know england better it would better. also be easier to do it if we were on tour you know because we're on tour people know where we are that's why we have a crowd Paul? 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 Sorry. Many of the top artists and musicians in the pop field today I said that the Beatles have been a major influence in their music. Are there any other artists who have a, an important influence on you, the music you create? Oh, yes. Nearly everyone. You know, we, we pinch as much from other people as they pinch from us, you know. Yeah. Ringo, do you carry wallet pictures of your baby with you? Uh, no. No? Why? I don't carry photos of anything, you know. I can remember. Yeah. Uh, may I ask about the song uh, Eleanor Rigby? What was the motivation or inspiration for that? Two queers. <laughs> John, um, did you ever? <laughs> Two battle boys. Oh, this is getting disgusting. This, but what? John, did you ever meet Cass of the Mamas and Papas? Yes, and she's great. I'm seeing her tonight. <laughs> Good. 
Yeah, she's good. Uh, have you ever trained or used beetle doubles as decoys? Uh, no, no. No, no. We tried to get Brian Epstein to do it. He wouldn't do it. Uh, Ringo, uh, one question. Uh, how much did you contribute to What Goes On? And are you contributing to any other Lennon McCartney compositions? I, um... About well, five words to what goes on, and not, I haven't done a thing since. <laughs> like the dresses to John and Paul, uh, you write a lot of stuff that other people steal from you and also purchase from you in different arrangements, uh, Ella Fitzgerald and the, a lot of these Boston Pops and stuff like that. When you listen to this on the radio or records and stuff, how do you feel about them using your pieces and changing them around to suit their styles? Depends how they do it, you know. The thing is, they don't steal it. No, I know that. What is it? You just said they did? Well, sometimes. <laughs> okay. no, they, I mean, you know, it's, once we've done a song and it's published, anyone can do it. So, you know, the, the, whether we like it or not depends on whether they've done it to our taste. You know, well, then let's we'll ask it this way. Who do you think does it the best, the Beatles songs? Us. <laughs> Who? Us. Oh. <laughs> Uh, for those of us that have followed your career from the early days of Liverpool and Hamburg and the pride in you've been awarded the MBE and the dismay of the unwarranted adverse publicity of late, the question is, individually, what has been your most memorable occasions and what has been the most disappointing? Mm. Well, I do. You know, there's so many. I Just think Manila was the most disappointing. <laughs> yeah. And the mm. most exciting yet to come. Uh, gentlemen. And maybe the most disappointing. Gentlemen, uh, there was quite a laugh when you went uh, on the stock market with your stock. How was your stock doing? Fine, thank well, you. it went down, but it's coming up again. It's gone it went down. down it's it's the same as any other stock, you know. It goes down. down every time. And the LPs drop out. They all think they're buying bits of records. All of you. Leonard Bernstein likes your music. How do you like Leonard Bernstein? Very good. He's, you know, great. One of the greatest. I'd like to... Uh, how has your image changed since 63? Uh, is it... Uh, a little more, uh, is it the same? An image is shiny? how you see us, so, you know, you can only answer that. You're the only one that knows. Who's that? Oh. It's you. Oh, you. well. <laughs> no, I want to get your opinion. Is it a little tarnished now? Is it more realistic, or what would you say it is? I know, I have my opinion, but... We haven't but, got uh, any tags for our opinion. We can't tell you our image, you know. We can only... Our, our image is what we read in the newspapers, and that's the same as you read, you know. The... I mean, we know our real image, which is nothing like our image. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, what I meant to say was... Uh, I like take two bricks. <laughs> Who is the young man with the lengthy haircut to your right rear? Right rear. That's good old Dave, isn't it? What is he? Who is Dave it? from the uh, birds, a mate of ours. You hoy mateys. Shy, Do shy. you ever plan to record in the United States, and why haven't you yet? We tried, uh, actually, but it was a financial matter. Mm, mm. Bit of trouble over that one. No, we tried, but uh, it didn't come politics. Up. Hush, hush. Dice. No comment. Mr. Lennon, is it true you're planning to give up music for a career in the field of comparative religion? No. <laughs> is that another of the jokes going on? I'm sure you've all heard of the many beetle burnings and beetle bonfires. And I was wondering, do you think American girls are fickle? All girls are fickle. Well, the poses we saw of them were a sort of middle-aged DJs and 12-year-olds burning a pile of LP covers. Uh, this question is directed to Paul and John. You have written uh, quite a few numbers for Peter and Gordon, and I understand they don't like it because they think that it's you writing the song that makes it popular. Do you plan to write any more songs for them? Uh, they, you know, if we write songs for they ask us to write songs for them if we, if we do it. I mean, they don't mind it. They like it, but it's... People come up and say, ah, we see you just getting in on the Lennon-McCartney bandwagon. That's, that's why um, they did that one with, with our names not on it, woman. Because everyone sort of thinks that's the reason they get hits. It's not true, really. 
Gentlemen, uh, what do you think would happen to uh, you four if uh, you came to an appearance without the armored truck and without police? We'd get in a lot easier. <laughs> we wouldn't make it. We couldn't do it. It depends, you know. Sometimes we could have easily made it much better without the armored truck. But today, probably we wouldn't have. You think you'd be physically harmed? Oh, yeah, probably. What do you think? Yes, I think so. Uh, could be. Uh, gentlemen, the uh, New York Times Magazine of Sunday, July 3, carried an article by Maureen Cleave, <laughs> in which uh, she quotes the Beatles, not by name, as uh, saying, show business is an extension of the Jewish religion. Would you mind amplifying Did she say that? that? Uh, I said that to her as well. No comment. Oh. Come on, John. Tell me what you I mean. mean, you can read into it what you like, you know. It's just a little old statement. It's not very serious, you know. I was wondering, under what condition did you write in his own right? That sort of wild, uh, <laughs> those kicky words. I mean, how did you, uh, you know, put the, piece them together? Oh, I don't know. And do you have any more books coming? Oh, uh, well, um, yes, and I can't answer that. You know, it's just the way it happens. Any more books coming? I didn't think, uh, how can I do this? Just like an author. <laughs> John. I hope so, you know. John. I don't know. It'll never be the same. I understand there's a suit pending against the Beatles by Peter Best, who claims to be a former member of the Beatles. Is that oh. true? Was he once a former? Uh, I think he's had a few, but we don't bother with those. Is this the last question? Are all of your news conferences like this? No. Well, uh, <laughs> that's not the. Last I'm talking question. about all of the uh, all of the reporters uh, or would be reporters or semi reporters that show up. Are you besieged by these kind of people throughout the tours that you travel here in the United States? You can't always tell the would bes from the real thing. So we Is it know. this way when you travel in Europe? Yes. But what's wrong with the, what's wrong with the crowd? Nothing. I'm just wondering if you have this many reporters everywhere you go. Oh. Mm. It's not always. But it's it's on. Some of them are just onlookers. No, no, on tomorrow. Is this mm. tomorrow's question? Thank you. Right, tomorrow never comes. It's the last cut on the second side, right? Tomorrow never knows. Tomorrow never knows. Thank That's you. Right. Uh, could you give me a vague idea of some of the tape manipulation you used when your voice drops into the track, John? Is that sung backwards by any chance and then recorded forwards? No, it's not sung backwards. It's just. Yeah, to do that. It's just uh, recorded pretty straight. You know, there's nothing really. Uh, there's tape loops on it. Which are a bit different. And uh, the words are from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Oh. So there. Fairly nearly. Mm. Oh well. Right, uh, now can we do the presentation that we were going to do slightly earlier for Alan J. Livingston, President of Capitol Records? Uh, when the boys come here, we always take advantage of the opportunity to present them with another gold record. Uh, because there's always one or more waiting for them. There's a little significance to this particular record in that uh, by receiving this, they will have received more gold records than any artist of any kind or type in the history of the Record Industry Association. So, uh, <laughs> It's a double-barreled question directed at both George and Paul, who are the two remaining... We're not getting married now. <laughs> okay. Who are direct... That's all I wanted to know. You're both the only bachelors, and you're not yeah. going to give us any indication of what your matrimonial plans might In be. In fact, soon we're going to just get an answering service for press conferences for that question. Thank yeah. you very much, We're George. both queer anyway, you know. Write <laughs> <laughs> that one in your magazine. Paul, do you feel that um, your vacation here in Los Angeles was a success, even though you didn't have very much privacy? Yeah. You had good. a chance to relax. What was your? We did have a lot of privacy. Did you mind the girls on the hill? No. Okay. What was your most enjoyable part of your vacation? Pardon? What was the most enjoyable part of your vacation? Just lazing around. Yeah, I think. I'm visiting Elvis. 
Well, may I direct this question towards uh, Paul and John? I understand you're uh, I understand you're Dylan fans. We all are you. We all are. You all Dylan fans. Even George. 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 Pardon? Did any of you help Mr. Epstein? No, no. <laughs> no, he needed it. No, we couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of the tunes in the uh, in Help sounded as if the sound might be changing just a little, getting even more sort of traditionally blues oriented. Maybe this is just an opinion. No, Do you feel that there's any change in the sound? We, yeah. we try and change every record. You know, we've tried to change from the first record we've made. And if you progress musically, then you naturally change. If you play our early records, and the ladies though we haven't made all that many, there's, there's a lot of difference, you know. We're not trying to do it consciously, you know, uh, particularly. Even re recording technique, you, if you improve that slightly, your sound changes, basically. Ringo, I understand that the record album Help has four different numbers in the English version and in the United States version. Is this uh, true, yes, and so why? Yeah. Because uh, we're in the English now. album there's 14 tracks Oh. And they're all our numbers, and on the American one, I don't know how many tracks there are, but then you've got some... There's seven of us. It's Rio's capital side. issue, all sort of mad stuff, you know, it's nothing to do with us. We See? make 14 tracks to be put out, but they keep a couple of them to come out later. It's a drag because, you know, the album, we, we make an album to be like an album, and, and to be a complete thing, and we send it over here. No offence, Capital, but <laughs> send it over here, and they put the soundtrack on, and if, so, you know, if someone's going to buy one of our records... I think they want to hear us and not sound. Right. They even changed right. the photograph off the front and put something daft on. Yeah. Either that or they should make it all sound. The capital would like to come round after we'll settle it. We'll see him. John and Paul. John, did you know that four girls have been circling above your home in a helicopter? I heard about two girls that have been in a helicopter. What? But that's all. Four. Oh. Were they driving it? We were embedded at the time. What do you think of the groupies or the girls that make a business of chasing groups? I think it's terrible. <laughs> do any of you go to church? No. No, not lately. What's your program for the next few months, say, for the next three or four months? Uh, like concerts or... Uh, Depends or on whatever. what Mr. Epstein wants to see. <laughs> Does he we have a month off for probably get back and it'll most probably just be TV and records and TV and bull rings and things like that. Be like that sort of stuff. There have been some quotes on some radio stations uh, in which you put down the movie magazines. You said that the things that they are saying are unfair, like Ringo always waves, and some movie magazine said that he did not wave, yeah. and television proved it. I, my question is, do you feel that, number one, there is a difference between the treatment that you have received by movie magazines and all other magazines, and teenage magazines specifically? Well, the teen ones and the movie ones are written by people that never leave the office and they just make it all up, you know, and it's a lot of rubbish. But there's nothing we can do about it because the libel laws are so peculiar over here. <sighs> well, no, yeah, movie magazines were talking about it, the same kind of thing. You know? But the thing is that teen magazines, like Sixteen magazine, well, even though the stuff they write is still rubbish. It might, it's not as bad as the movie mags, but it's still rubbish. But there's some, there's some great magazines, you know, and some crummy ones like Anywhere, but there's just a few more crummy ones over here, I think. <laughs> I mean, you know, you've got to admit it. If, if someone puts in, you know, is Richard Burton dying? I've just read about leaving the group as He's well. He's leaving yes, the group, it. definitely. No, I mean, I mean, definitely what married can you do about one. that? You know, you can't, you can't sue him here. What can you do? It's and fun you can't to read. Bring you know. him up and say, I'm not leaving the group. Where did you get this from? Because then they get big publicity out of yeah. it. So you just got to leave it. But we just keep telling everybody that they're lousy and hoping the kids will gradually cotton on, you know, just buy them for the photographs and don't think, believe all the rubbish. The thing is, if you read them like fiction instead of fact, it's much better, you know. But you get all these letters and are you really leaving? Or is Paul married? And have you got 12 wives? And all that stuff, you know. I love them, And though, it's I worrying. Know. It's nice to read I've got 12 words. John and, jo and John and Paul, in creation of Beatles' song, between inception and actual creation of the product, what's the process and how long does it take? It varies. 
It's just sitting down and working it out, you know. It, it can take days or it can just take a couple of hours. Depends on how easy it is. Sir. Pa? I'd like to ask about. Ringo, uh, which country he enjoyed touring the best of everything that he's... Uh, America. I enjoy America, you know. It's, it's, it's so different to England. I mean, all the other places are different, but at least you can speak to people over here, you know. <laughs> In a way, you know. Paul, how do you, how do you go about selecting the um, the songs you are going to do for a concert? We we just do on a concert. We just do songs that are known. That's all. So we just pick um, the songs that are best known. Is there one particular favorite that you do at uh, at many of the concerts? We do we do most of them most of the ones that we do now. We, we do we've most done the at all the concerts. Ones. All our records, you know. Uh, what group do you consider the largest challenge to your popularity? Can I ask Paul? Um, yeah. <laughs> you can ask me. I don't know, though. There's a new one every week, you know. Yeah, the Silky, I think. Big challenge there. Socks. Up and coming. Do uh, any uh, of you actually get any fan mail at all, or is it all channeled through your fan clubs? Really? We get more. We get well, yeah, yeah, we get it because off. 16 Magazine prints at our addresses in, you know, <laughs> handily for the fans. Well, do you um, ever actually answer it, or also do you accept registered letters from fans? Yeah, we, we get a lot of mail that we answer ourselves. Did but there's so much of it goes mail. into fan club the branches and offices the mail all over the world. America is that they put self-addressed envelopes with American stamps on. If they thought a minute, they'd know that it doesn't work. They should put English ones on. Oh, would you mail it if they put English ones on? We, may, we answer quite a bit, especially when we get months off. You get to, you're standing there at nine o'clock waiting for the postman for <laughs> something to do. <laughs> Paul, you've been, Paul, you've been described as having the face of a typical matinee idol. How do you feel about this? I don't feel about that, you know. I hate that. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Rugged, rugged, okay. Five o'clock matinee. Oh, you know. Last summer in San Francisco, a uh, doctor said that the Beatles uh, were instruments of the communist uh, propaganda. <laughs> that, you were, that you were softening up and corrupting America's youth. Yes. What yes, did you uh, say to that? Watch out next year. Yeah, you know, doctor of what? Who was, was it that said it? Who was it, you know? He's just some half you know. They call themselves doctors and Nurses. sergeants and things. <laughs> We're all capitalists anyway, you know, don't worry. Capitalists! Got it! <laughs> <laughs> it went down well in Chicago. There was a lot of criticism uh, over your being awarded the Royal uh, Order of the British we Empire. We didn't get the order, we got the M. Whatever that one the is. MBE, the not the MBE, MBE, of the order. British Empire. Yeah. Not the Royal Order. Yeah, but the Order's it's a the better one. Anyway, yeah, we got the it's the first step on the way to knighthood, right? It isn't. It isn't at all. I thought it was. We don't give enough to charity for. It is for some I right. see. But anyway, there were some members who had received the same award yeah. who had turned theirs in. Well, what is your reaction to this? Well, this. ours were civil awards, and theirs were sort of. What are they? The military heroes. Military, yeah, they got yeah, for killing yeah. people, and I think you know we deserve we don't kill not killing people. Anyway, you know we've got them, and they haven't. Um, yeah, and most of them are yeah. French Canadians, you know. Yeah, you know so what they're like. moaning about. <laughs> oh. If they send any more. Oh, back, what uh, what great? American group do you admire the most? The birds. The birds. Yeah. And they admire the loving spoonful. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to uh, direct this question to any one of you. Is it true? We heard a rumor over here that your English, uh, uh, your British version of the last movie, Hard Day's Night, was longer than ours over here. Is this true? No. No. And were there portions, uh, a great deal of the movie help cut? You get no, the same film is. You get nearly, gets... nearly the same film, only we have no, to... Uh, I think, I think you do, but the thing is, for America, we have to cut out the word toilet. Exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> we have to call it a bathroom. For oh, yeah, right. This is this has to be the last question. That's true. That's true. We have to cut out a few words because they. What do you think of your uh, movie, A Hard Day's Night, being nominated for an Academy Award? What do you think of that? It's funny, isn't it? Mm. That's all. Uh, uh, there's there's been a lot of controversy over the fact that since there's so much screaming at your concerts, you don't sort of rehearse them before or worry too much about them. Is that true? We never have. Well, we always sing songs that we've been that we know. 
Because so we, we must know them because we recorded them, so we don't need to rehearse them, do we? And it doesn't bother us. The only thing we've got to know is which ones we're time, doing. You know. The thing is, you know, we still don't rehearse for places where they can hear us, like on the Ed Sullivan show. And, you know, when, the, on the, when it comes on television, you can hear it. Sort of, uh, you know, much better than at a concert. We still don't rehearse for that. We never have, you know. I read something recently that you are Never worrying about <laughs> <laughs> worrying about the Beatles being brought down. Certain people are interesting, interested in getting the Beatles over with. Uh, oh, I, don't know. I think that's a bit of a one that's you know I don't really know about that story honestly. There's no be I've never said there's no be trying to get like pull us down. I agree that if there was if we were slipping, there's lots of people that clap hands, Daddy, come home. What kind but of people do you think would be interested? I don't know because they never show themselves until that time arises when it's ripe for them. Do you feel you are slipping? We don't feel we're slipping. Our music's better. Our sales might be less. So in our view, we're not slipping. Yeah. You know. How many years do you think you can, you can go on? Have you thought about that? It doesn't matter, you know. The thing is, you know, we just you just try and go forward. And the thing is, if we do it slip, it doesn't matter, you know. I mean, so what? You know, we slip, and so we're not popular anymore. So we'll be all sun popular, won't we? You know, we'll be like we, we were before, maybe. Yeah. And we can't invent a new gimmick to keep us going like people imagine we do. Did you say that Britain is becoming a police state? Oh, I'll tell you, we've really been putting our feet in it lately. <laughs> you can't say anything, you know, without it turning into the worst quote ever. I mean, it's only just in passing saying it to a friend, you see. That's what we forget we're Beatles sometimes. You can't help it. We're still us inside. And if you say something like that, I didn't say it, it was one other. But when you say something like, Britain's becoming a police state, you say it exactly the same as anybody in a pub saying it to their friend across the bar. About some sweeping statement, which anyway, they can't it, back up anyway. And it's obvious it's not to be taken literally, because if it was, then you wouldn't be allowed to say that, would you? Oh, I'd like to ask you, um, with, your, with your music and your lyrics, uh, do you write the lyrics or do you write the music? Or is John is the other way around with John and you? No, with the, with the songs that we write, we both write lyrics and music. And it depends, you know, like with uh, some songs I write lyrics and music, and so does John with some other songs. On some, we just get together and just do a line each, you know, words and music each. Depends, you know, how it happens and what kind of mood we're in. It's normally no formula about it, though. How did you feel about your performance out there today? I think it was answered all the enjoyed it. Don't you? I enjoyed it, you know, it was quite good. The thing was that the amps uh, broke down, you know, in one of the numbers, because uh, there was some business with the, one of the wires broke or something, so which was a bit of a drag, you know, but uh, nobody seemed to notice. <laughs> Do you think that the uh, this God thing is quashed forever now? Well, it should be, you know, I mean, the amount of time we spent on it, and, the, you know, we... I don't know, all last night, trying to explain to everyone about it, so we didn't really mean it like that, you know. And I think, uh, you know, from what I've seen of the people who've heard what we had to say about it, they, they seem to think it's okay now, you know. It should be, you know, because, I mean, I didn't think it was ever un-okay. You know. <laughs> About the uh, Revolver album, the, the Indian songs that you're getting on it, yeah. who is mainly responsible for this side of the... The Indian, the Indian yeah, songs, the Indian songs. Uh, George. Yeah. George has been stuck. De definitely mainly George, because uh, we started off, you know, just hearing Indian music and sort of listening to things, and we liked the drone idea, because we'd done a bit of that kind of thing in songs before, you know. But George got very interested in it and went to a couple of Ravi Shankar concerts and then he sort of met Ravi and sort of was knocked out by him and thought, like, just as a person, he's an, he's an incredible fellow, you know, he's, he's one of the greatest. And uh, he thought he didn't know that George was serious about it. And so when he found out George was serious, he was knocked out too. So the two of them are having a great time. <laughs> and, you know, that's how we've got Indian sounds on at the moment. Because the thing is, anyway, it's nice to sort of start bridging the two kinds of music. You know, because we, we just started off in a very simple way. And then this album's got a bit better. I mean, it's a little bit more like Indian music. And it helps people to understand it, too, because it's very, it's very hard at first to understand, yeah. Once you get into it, it's the greatest. 
who decided on this uh, Tomorrow Never Knows weird effects? In it? Weird effects. Uh, well, see, we wrote the song, and it was a very funny start song from the start because John came up with the lyrics to it, and he'd just been reading Tibetan Book of the Dead, and he want, he was dead impressed by it, you know, very impressed. <laughs> and uh, he decided that he'd um, write the song, and we only had one verse. I think we stretched it to sort of two verses, and we couldn't think of any more words because we sort of said it all what we wanted to say in about two verses. So we had to try and work out how to sort of do it and how to make it different. So I decided to do some of those those loops that I've been doing on my home tape recorder, and they're just tape loops, and I'd been making them. So I just took a longer. A, a, a bag full of six tape loops to the session and we just tried them and mixed them in and brought them in in those places and so, uh, so I suppose it was sort of vaguely my idea that that bit of it Do you find opposition from people who want you to play to the teenagers? Yeah, well the thing is you see uh, we've kept quite a few songs on the album I mean if we just suddenly did exactly what we'd want to do um, in fact, I think actually at the moment that is what we want to do, what we did, what we've done on Revolver. But if we did, like, all the way out things, I mean, I suppose people think they're way out. I don't, actually, but that, that kind of thing. If we did all, a whole album of them, then uh, we'd be doing what, like, the people who do electronic music do. They go too far out too suddenly, and no one stays with them. You know, everyone else is left behind because they're miles out ahead, sort of digging all this electronic stuff. But in fact, what we've tried to do is like do the last album, Rubber Soul, a bit more towards that, then this one a bit more, and the next one should be a bit more. And if people stay with us, you know, it's great. Love it. Who, de who decided the two tracks to go as a single from the From the uh, LP? Yeah. Um, I think we all did, you know. I think it was a case of... We knew that when the album came out, there'd be uh, quite a few people going to cover it, so we thought we might as well have the hit, you know. <laughs> I think Rick will be another uh, yesterday. I don't know, I don't think he actually, the only thing that's similar to yesterday is the fact that uh, there's uh, violins and string instruments on it. Apart from that, I think it's nothing to do with it. It's a completely different kind of tune. I think it's uh, better in a way, but I sang yesterday better. I sang Eleanor Rick terrible. <laughs> wow. Sorry, but no, it's, oh. you listen to it, you know, and it's... Uh, we well, okay. okay. <laughs> Actually, then, for what you, uh, your music now is improving every time, and you're making uh, the lyrics uh, more interesting also, aren't you? Well, see, that's the thing. I mean, if we stayed where we were in, say, 1960, when we were doing Love Me Do, and then um, Please Please Me, and From Me to You, which was one kind of thing, you know. It was the kind of thing people liked. The thing is, if we did that now, I think... Um, our fans, so the kind of fans that we got now, wouldn't like that too much because it'll be going back and it'll be retracing your steps, you know. And also, from our point of view, we're never going to do that because I mean, if we ever have to do that, if anyone suddenly says you're going too way out, you've got to get back to then. But we'll give up, you know. Recently, uh, at the last press uh, reception, which I didn't think it was too grand, uh, we had in Washington, that is. Yeah. Uh, the questions that were asked, one of them said that were on about the crowds at the stadiums just recently. And uh, they wanted to know how you felt about it because they were, say, 20,000, 25,000, where before you used to get more. But yeah, I, no, I don't mind about that. You know, the thing is, the people keep saying to us, look, your record sales have gone down and your concert appearances have gone down. But the thing is that uh, compared with anyone else, they haven't. And the only people who set the records beforehand were us, you know, like for, uh, for, for the concerts. But apparently, at the moment, we still play to more people than any other group does. That's correct. And, uh, so, I mean, you know, that doesn't worry us, because everyone else goes down in proportion. I mean, the only time if we were going to be worried by the whole sort of rat race, which we're not, you know, it's, it doesn't really worry us. But if it did worry us, it might be when, for instance, another group started selling more records or more seats than us. Then we might get a bit, a bit worried, you know, but this doesn't worry us at all. We're still doing what's fine, you know. But don't you think that the time when it comes, when there'll be no more open-air performances or indoor performances for you, that your records will still be going on selling even ten years from now? Well, I don't know. You see, this is the thing, actually, that, that we are more interested, really, in, in making music than we are 
um, probably in actually performing it because we're not very good performers, you know. We're, we haven't ever been able really to do what we've been able to do on records on the stage. And also when you, we play these big concerts, you know, it gets a bit more impossible each time to sort of get over to the people what you're trying to get over. So we're, we're tending a bit more to get this over on records, you know, in the lyrics of words and the, in the lyrics of songs, I mean. Uh, you know, so that, that I think that's getting a bit more important and I hope it does go on for about, you know, as long as you like. Latch, then, with your recordings and also coming about your open performances, you're improving yourself each time. Well, I hope so, you know. I, I think probably we are, you know. But, um, yeah, we're trying to anyway. Now, speaking of back home in England, Paul, where is it you're exactly living now? Is it in the centre of London or, or uh, out on one of the counties? like? No, it's just know? about uh, two minutes outside London in St. John's Wood, you know. St. John's Wood. Oh. Yeah. You're not living in uh, uh, Weybridge or no, no. with the other lads? And... No, well, you see, the kind of house I wanted is that, like only exists sort of, well, mainly exists a couple of minutes out of London. And also I like cities, you know, so uh, I, got, I got the house there. I mean, I did think, obviously, you know, well, I ought to sort of go out to Weybridge and things, but I mean, I've talked to the others about it since, and we've, both, we've all decided that it was would be silly for me to, like, buy a house in Weybridge that I wasn't very keen on. Um, you know, just to sort of go along with the whole thing. And we can still get to see each other dead easily. You know, I mean, we only live sort of, an, uh, for the most, say, half an hour away from each other. So we're still in pretty good contact, you know, and if I want to go out for a swim, I go out to their place. Oh, marvellous. Well, now, when you get back home from this tour, will you be taking a holiday, say, in Spain or somewhere like this? Uh... I don't know, actually. I may do. We've got a few weeks off, you know. But I know, see, for instance, we want to do a record for Christmas. You know, we want to have a record for Christmas. So we've got to start thinking about that now. You know, we've got to start thinking about... The, the next film that we do so there's a lot of things you know it's like these people who start opening Christmas clubs in June mm. you know we've got to start thinking about things like that now so uh, it, it, it may, it'll be a holiday but I think it'll be a holiday in which we'll be trying to think of things for when it isn't a holiday you know I mean we'll take it easy I heard you uh, took a trip to Spain before once didn't you on holiday mm. I didn't go to Spain no uh, I tried once to make Spain but and John and I were going to hitchhike but we hitchhiked down from Liverpool. Uh, we didn't hitchhike. No, we got the train down from Liverpool because we thought, well, we won't hitchhike the first bit. And we got the boat over to Paris. And we got the train into Paris because we thought, well, it'd be too hard to get, get a hitch here. And we just stayed in Paris all week. Eventually, I, I mean, all the time trying to get out of Paris and make Spain, you know. We never made it. We just flew home at the end. <laughs> Real lazy hitchhiking holiday. Um, by the way, I'd like to ask you just one more. Because what do you think about the other night at Cleveland when we had the great rush of the... Uh, young people there for the show well, how do you feel about that well the thing is you see that the, I was talking to someone about our shows and I was saying that the great thing nowadays about our shows is uh, it's a completely different thing from what it used to be it used to be that we performed and that everyone sort of sat back and listened to us in the very early days and occasionally sort of joined in but as it's gone bigger and bigger and, and, uh, and the whole thing has sort of improved a lot uh, it's got now it's gone along the track of the audience participating an awful lot, you know. So, I mean, now, for instance, when the kids are all shouting and things, it's part of our show. You know, the, the audience is half of our show, you know, easily. And we're sort of less of our show than we used to be. But, I mean, we don't mind that. It's great to have somebody else working on a show with you. You know, it's like all those people are in our act, you know. Yeah. So that's fine. I mean, we'd love that. And so, for instance, when they do break through and things, as long as, like, nobody gets hurt... And as long as it's not too dangerous. Because, I mean, yeah, we've been through more dangerous things. We used to have fights when we started off, I mean, in the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, we were a lot more dangerous than that. Like, there'd be a hundred fellas fighting another hundred from the next district. And, you know, there'd be bottles and chairs going all over the place. And that was more dangerous than it gets now. So, I mean, it doesn't particularly worry us. As long as nobody else get hurt, gets hurt, we, we love it. Love every minute of it. But actually, I think the other night at Cleveland, when all these youngsters siege forward, yeah. it wasn't the act of violence or anything like this. It oh, was more no. love for you than anything else. Well, oh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think any of them are violent. You know, they just come along. There's maybe one or two in a crowd of about a thousand that's violent. But generally, they just want to... I mean, for instance, the other night, they all just came to the front of the stage Nobody really tried to make much effort to get up on the stage, you know. Admittedly, there were a sort of big gang of coppers saying, get off. But uh, I think they just wanted to sort of see us, listen to us and that, you know. 
It wasn't too bad at all. I enjoyed it. Well, actually, what we're trying to say now is that uh, the Beatle mania is still here in America, and you're still loved, even though the papers might uh, put uh, words differently. So oh, yeah, you listen, proved the point, haven't you? Well, I think the thing is that, like, every newspaper anywhere, when, it, when they get articles about Beatle mania and, every, you know, so many seats sold out and things, they can't go on forever writing that because it's no longer news after a bit. They've got to start knocking because it's the only way they can get any news out of it, you know and talk about us or else they don't talk about us. So they try and find sort of the knocking things in what we say, like John's r remark on Christianity, you know, and they try and knock it because it makes a big news story for them. But, uh, I, you know, it doesn't worry us that because, I mean, we just go along, we do the same things we always did uh, in a way, and we don't worry about them. As charismatic as he is outgoing and controversial... Alistair Taylor was one of the best interviews I ever had relating to the Beatles. He was quick, on target, and really, really funny. We spoke together in a New York hotel room in the late 80s about, well, just about everything relating to his time with the Fab Four. Long since having left show business completely, Alistair looks back in his time with the Beatles with a mixture of regret, deep emotion, compassion, and, as I said, a great sense of humor. We began our conversation by discussing the untimely death of Brian Epstein. Yes, I don't think, you know, there's a lot been said about how he went around saying they were going to be bigger than Elvis and all that. I don't, I, I can't remember it being as, as blatant as that. I don't know what the right word is. Uh, I mean, we were enthusiastic, he was, and we went for lunch that same day and we sat and we talked and what we should do. But I think it was, I think that the great excitement came a little later when it dawned on him what, that, that he'd signed them. You know, uh, it was just something new. It was it, it was fun. I mean, he came and twice. I had a phone call from him saying goodbye. He was committing suicide. You know, and I've often said, in many ways, I would have been happier, I suppose, if he had committed suicide. You don't think he did? No, no, he didn't. What happened? Accidental death. I was there behind the doctor. Thirty seconds. You see, this is the the times I have been asked the question, why did he commit suicide? And I want someone to tell me where it is said that he committed suicide. The verdict by the coroner was accidental death. The whole survey revealed accidental death. I have never, there were only two people in that room. One was the doctor and one was myself. Right? And I've never said it was suicide. You know, I've heard stories about there was a note found. I didn't find it. A lot of bullshit been talked about Apple. Right. Apple was set up purely and simply as a tax-saving project. Instead of paying 19 and 6 in the pound, we could only pay 16 shillings. Right? And at, at, in the beginning, when there was an executive board of Apple, the boys and Brian didn't want to know. Right? It was Clive Epstein, myself, Jeffrey Ellis, a solicitor and an accountant. And the idea was that we would just quietly get on and announce to the tax authorities that we would be opening a string of shops. That was the original idea. And the boys heard about this, and they decided this could be boring, right? And they didn't want their name above a string of what the original idea was, was greetings card shops. You know, imagine Beatles greeting card shops. And they didn't dig that at all. And they started drifting in on meetings. And it evolved from that. And it really became more so that it turned into this silly philosophy, admittedly. But all it really was, was to get rid of the hassle of big business. Why couldn't business be fun and pleasure? That's all. That's what it was all about. In mid-1994, Harry Nielsen, that famous singer from the 60s and 70s, passed away at home of a heart attack. Like his good friend Keith Moon before him, Harry had lived many lifetimes within his short years. One of his most famous roles, though, was as John Lennon's best friend, a relationship he coveted right up until the day he died. I spoke to him about John, the Beatles, and much more at an anti-handgun rally in New York. I had to hold uh, Ringo's hand for a week. You know what that's like? It's like saying, listen, man, if I could take it from you, I would. You know, but I, but I can't. But if I would, I could. I just can't. There's nothing I could do, but let's do something about it, maybe. You know, let's put it into some of the stupidity. 
Ringo and I speak uh, a couple times a week. We're very, very dear friends. Good night, Ringo. Sleep uh, tight. He's my pal. He was best man at our wedding. He's one of the, he's one of the dearest friends you can have in life. He's godfather to our children. And if, I hope I'm his best pal in life, you know. George and I are very, very good friends. Paul is just Paul. I don't know. I've known Paul over the years, but I don't know him like Ringo or George. You know, I knew John a lot more than Paul. Paul is an amazing guy. Smokes his joints and whistles his way through life, you know. I God bless him, too. Perhaps my biggest coup as a journalist to date was my 1983 interview with Yoko Ono at her Dakota apartment home in New York. Here's a brief snippet of our conversation. After John died, uh, somehow when people call me Mrs. Lennon, I feel good about it. Yeah. And when people write to me saying, well, you know, we're grieved over John's death and uh, we just wanted to know how his widow was doing or whatever. You know, and that would have maybe uh, made me feel a bit strange. Uh, two years ago, you know, mm -hmm. but now I sort of I'm grateful that people are writing uh, because they love John and concerned about, by the way, his family. That's fine. Yes, I am, by the way, family. <laughs> you know, let's say that that uh, it mellowed me in a way. As Yoko, and I'm very mellowed uh, to the point that yes, it's all right that I I am Mrs. Lennon. You know, and it's a nice new feeling that I'm sort of enjoying. So that uh, independence thing is rapidly sort of disappearing. Yeah. And um, if John thought of it's all right, and that's why I slapped it on my album, that's fine. Thank you very much, John. You know, that's the feeling. Part of us, of course, uh, John and I felt that we know it all, and uh, it seems like we uh, know about enlightenment and this and that. So. Um, there was that arrogant side of us, and this was like a big hammer from above saying, well, just remember you don't know it, you know, <laughs> there's a lot more to learn. And, you know, I feel that now John is helping me through Sean. By his actions over the years, Paul McCartney has made it clear he very much enjoys the slightly hallucinogenic relaxing effects of marijuana. As if to prove the point, he has been busted for possession of the naughty herb on several occasions. In this never-before-released clip, he defiantly gives his views on the matter after returning from a holiday in Barbados where he was once again busted in his deluxe rented villa after being blown in by a rather unscrupulous local dope dealer. Do you think it's going to give you a problem getting back into the United States? Where well, I hope about? not. <laughs> I you, jolly well hope not. Who shot you? Who shot you? Who shot you? I've no idea. Who shot you in the chair? I've no idea. Do you have trouble getting to the news? Oh, what a good job. Oh, Rob, get out of here. Hey, can we get one of these straight? That whatever you think and whatever you think I've done, this, I'm telling you, this substance, cannabis, is a whole lot less harmful right. than rum punch, whiskey, nicotine, and glue, all of which are perfectly legal. What about, about your children? children? What about your children? I would like to see it decriminalized. Because I don't think, in the privacy of my own room, I was doing anyone any harm whatsoever. Well, well, you, what, do you think they've taken you for drugs? Are you? I don't take drugs. I never Good. have taken drugs. Are you Good. going to? No. Were you worried about being... Never said? again. Never Were you worried again. about being... <laughs> What follows are snippets from Paul's many colorful press conferences from around the world, held during the course of his wildly successful 1989-90 world tour. There's been a flood of uh, unreleased uh, Beatles recordings, very high quality, the ultra-rare tracks you probably heard about. Yeah. What are your feelings on that, uh, about the release of those things, and would you like to see EMI release them officially? Um, that's kind of a difficult question, you know, it's like... Um, as far as the Beatles were concerned, we, we released all our good material, except for maybe one or two little things that we just, at the time, we didn't like. Um, th there are one or two tracks that I think are worth looking at. Um, Leave My Kitten Alone, John Sings, which I think that, like, that's very good. Um, there are a couple of other things we do. But in the main, we released all our best material. So, But, you know, it's like, it's like memorabilia. People just like it, you know, even if there's like a track that uh, was was the take we didn't use or something. Or, so I suppose, you know, if people are interested, it's it's fair enough. I mean, I don't get uptight about bootlegs, you know, what, what are you going to 
I'd like to, yeah, we'd, we'd like to do that, you know. It's the same thing happened to us in the early days of the Beatles merchandising. Um, you know, like Mickey Mouse and those kind of merchandise things make a lot of money and stuff, and we, we were in the same position with the Beatles stuff. It was like Beatles talcum powder, Beatles knickers, you name it, it had Beatles on it. But uh, we had to make an early decision, which was like, you know, if they do it, we can't run around the world policing you know, Malaysia and Japan, you know, I mean, how are you going to do that? It's just too big an operation. So you just have to, you know, if you can stop it, like in a concert where you have some kind of control, that's why they stop it there. But generally, I don't really bother too much, you know, it's like spilled milk. Paul, you're 47 and you had a tour in 13 years. Is this it for people in the United States? Are you going to be... No, people, I think people assume when uh, us guys and the Stones and the Who and people like like us of our age uh, come on tour I think the, the first assumption is oh well this has got to be the last time um, I've never said that and it certainly don't, don't feel to me like the last time uh, it feels really good um, before the tour you know I was wondering whether it would be uh, a bit of a headache you know and it would be sort of physically hard to do because there's a lot of singing there you know like about what something like two and a quarter hours a night but in fact, I've found it real easy and a real pleasure. That's why I haven't cancelled. <laughs> you look great. Any, any nips and tucks, or would you tell? Well, there's just a couple. We've we'll just had a couple here. And what do you think of the new kids on no, the I haven't had any nips and tucks, actually. What do you think of the new kids on the block? They're new. <laughs> Well, did your daughters go through a teen idol craze where they really like somebody and it's weird to see that from the other side of the Yeah, I know, it was funny actually, it was, it was, it was cute, because um, my daughter Mary, who's now 20, coming up to 21, she was in love with Donny Osmond when she was little, and when he was little, and um, <laughs> she used to really love him, and he was once on the television and he was singing the 12th of Never, uh, right to the camera, and she turned to us, she said, he loves me. <laughs> He's singing this to me. And we didn't, you know, we didn't tell her he wasn't. So, you know, it's, I think it's quite nice, really. You know, it's, it's good fun, isn't it? You know, crazes and stuff. We all went through them. I, I hope they keep coming, myself. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is, you know, one of the latest ones. It's groove. Who cares? Do you what? James. James being a teenager. Yeah, he's, he's kind of into that, yeah. I, I'm quite into it. Too. It's a bit of fun, you know. It's a laugh. I mean, I like pretty light-hearted stuff. I think it's a heavy old world we're in, you know. So anything that's a bit light-hearted, I haven't really got a major problem with normally. Speaking of that heavy old world, in the '60s, performers yeah. could just play their music, and that's all we expected of them. Yeah. Do you feel that uh, the audience expects more responsibility or some sort of a political statement from a performer like yourself? I don't know. I hadn't thought it had gone as far as people actually expecting it, but it certainly has moved that way. Um, that's the way our neck of the business has kind of progressed. I personally think it's a good thing, really, um, but I'm sure if you asked any of us, like me with the Friends of the Earth or Sting with the Rainforest or Peter Gabriel or Bob Geldof or any of the people who have been crusading, if they'd rather have the government do it, I know the answer would be yes. But the point is, in the absence of any action by our elected representatives, it falls to people, other people in the public eye, you know, and I say, I don't want the job. You get, you get Bush and Thatcher and the rest of them, you know, to clean up the world, uh, I'll be the first one to stop bothering with it, you know. But that's what's happened. It's, uh, they don't do it. Nobody responded. No world leaders responded to Live Aid. It was kids. It was, it was ordinary people. It was this Irish bog bandit called Bob Geldof who swore his way through that. And people responded with 50 million pounds, you know. The government didn't send anything like that. I think it's a funny old world, but uh, that's the way it is. Someone's got to do it.
Mr. Epstein, the Beatles have tended to overshadow all the other artists you have uh, working for you or for whom you work. What sort of size of empire have you got now? Um, we have seven acts. I call them acts because five of those are groups and two of them are soloists. That's um, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, which is a separate entity, his backing group, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Tommy Quickly, The Foremost, Silla Black, and Sounds Incorporated. And what about the administrative staff to support all this? What well, it varies slightly, because um, we've just moved into London, mm -hmm. and we're gathering new staff, but um, it's approximately 25. What sort of size of empire is it in terms of money? One's read some staggering figures that the Beatles have earned for their recording company mm. in the last year. What sort of turnover does this empire produce? I couldn't give you an answer to that. I really don't know. Because don't forget that the company has only... The companies which can uh, manage these artists, to which they are contracted, has only been in operation for June... since June 1962. Mm -hmm. The papers have been... A accusing you of being Mr. 25%. If the turnover is as big as we were implying then, this means a very large income from you. Is it, in fact, a lot in the entertainment business? Is it, a high it isn't. It isn't. And uh, one's profits from that 25% in this business are not really fantastic because my own personal expenses in connection with the management of artists are quite fantastic, really. What sort of expenses are those? Well, when I fly to America, or I fly to America in order to um, fish around to see, to arrange bookings and so on and so forth, uh, I pay my own fares. I can, if, if I contract um, the Beatles to, say, the Ed Sullivan show, he'll pay fares for the boys and possibly their road matches, mm -hmm. but I don't consider that I can, uh, that he should pay my fare because I don't strictly travel with them wherever they go. So wherever I go, I have to pay my own expenses, and that all comes out of that 25%. Plus, of course, uh, for that 25%, we um, arrange for them to have all their photographs, we arrange their transport, and the, you can imagine the telephone calls that we make on behalf mm -hmm. of, say, the Beatles, which is sort of worldwide, really. Mm. Immense telephone bills. Tremendous, yes. Well, it seems a funny sort of world for a young man like you to be in. How did you get into it? How did you start? I started uh, whilst I was in charge of the records division of a family concern of which I was and am, as it happens, still a director. Uh, we were asked, or I was asked, by a young boy for a record by a group called by The Beatles, and it always had been our policy in records to look after whatever request was made. And I followed up this inquiry. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and it was only after a week or two that he told me that they were, in fact, a Liverpool group. I, I assumed, for some reason, that they were from Germany. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he told me that they were a Liverpool group and that they'd just, in fact, returned from Germany and that they were playing in a club called The Cavern, uh, about a hundred yards away from my office, and I arranged to go down there, and I saw them one midday session. This is a pretty, and at the time, it was a pretty, uh, pretty much of an eye-opener to go down into this darkened, yeah. dank, smoky cellar in the middle of the day uh, and to see crowds and crowds of kids watching these four um, young men on stage. They were sort of f rather scruffily dressed mm. in, in the nicest possible way, or I should say in, in the most attractive way. Mm -hmm. um, black leather jackets and jeans, uh, long hair, of course, and a uh, rather untidy stage presentation, not terribly aware and not caring very much what they, s what they looked like. I think they cared more even then what they sounded like. Mm. I think they still care more what they sound like. Obviously, they know the importance now of what they look like because of, you know, television and so on. The changes in their appearance, are they due to you? Have you encouraged them to go to dress in such a way and so on? I would say that it was due to the five of us rather than to me. Um, I encouraged them at first to get out of leather jackets and jeans and that I wouldn't allow them to appear in jeans 
uh, after a short time. And then after that step, uh, I got them to wear, I think, sweaters on stage. And then, uh, very reluctantly, eventually suits. I think it was for their fir one of their first sort of major appearances. I'm not sure they didn't wear their first suits for a BBC broadcast to a live audience. These suits with the beetle collar uh, are, in fact, a, a German uh, type of jacket. I first saw them in Germany some years ago. Did the boys choose this type of suit, or you? Uh, they did, actually, um, very much with my approval. I thought it was an excellent design at the time. Uh, it quickly became sort of rather overworked mm. and no longer sort of interesting for them to wear. But uh, they first discovered it, I think, the idea originated from France, Pierre Cardin. On that day you first went to the cavern and saw the Beatles, did you talk to them then? Yes, I did. Yes, I met them. You'd spotted their talent. You'd seen they had something. Did you sign them up there and then? Oh, no. No, I've never done that with any artist. In actual fact, I commenced to go around with them almost a week or so after having first met them. Uh, and then they, we worked out a basis for an agreement which they didn't actually sign, and I didn't actually start to take anything out of their money, of which there was very little in any case, um, until, oh, about four months afterwards. Uh, actually, the first meeting that we had, the first business meeting we had, we held at my store. It got off to a very late start. It was quite, quite amusing, really. Um, three of the boys arrived at the appointed time at four o'clock. I was very busy ordering records for Christmas, and uh, Paul didn't show at all for at least three quarters of an hour and I was a bit put out about this I thought this is the first meeting they want to do something about management and so on and I asked one of the boys to get on the phone to him and he came back and he said well he's just got up he's in the bath so I sort of you know <laughs> shouted about a bit and I thought this is very disgraceful indeed and uh, how can he be so late for an important thing and um George just simply replied, it was very typical of them, well, he may be late, but he's very clean. Yet you picked these boys, who've now gone right to the top of all the available trees that there are for them. Why? What, what was it about them? I liked them enormously. I immediately liked the sound that I heard. I heard their sound before I met them. Mm. And I think, actually, that's important, because... Uh, I think that it should always be remembered that, in fact, people hear their sound and like their sound before they meet them. They are important. But I was... I immediately liked what I heard, and I thought that it was something that an awful lot of people would like. They were fresh, and they were honest, and they had what I thought was a sort of presence and... Uh, this is a terrible, vague term, star quality... Whatever that is, they had it. Or I, I sense that they had it. This honesty, is this going to go the way of all flesh? Is it going to be corrupted by time and the exposure that they're subject to? Certainly not. I think that actually that they will go in the reverse direction. They will become more honest and even less phony. They're not phony at all, but uh, I think that they're so aware of this simple... Uh, presence that they project. I was interested in one thing you were saying then when you first saw the Beatles. They appeared to have little idea of stage presentation, uh, which implies some sort of knowledge or feeling for that for yourself. Have you had any such training? Yes, I was studied at RADA for 18 months uh, prior to going, or going back, I should say, into the family business. Let's get your education organised properly. Let's talk about your family so that all this fits into context. What sort of family uh, is your family? Uh, middle class background, perhaps a little better, shop, you know, retail stores, uh, old established, started by my grandfather, uh, principally in furniture. When I left school at the age of 16, I had ambitions to be a dress designer uh, and also to be an actor, but my family weren't very keen on this, and I allowed myself to be swayed uh, into going into the business. I think I was more anxious to leave school than anything else, which I didn't enjoy very much. Which school was it? Reakin College, Shropshire. Mm -hmm. Went into the family business, and I did an apprenticeship for a furniture company outside of ours for about six months, 
and then uh, found myself back in the family business and interested myself in the display and advertising side. In fact, uh, we opened um, a store specifically for me to work in uh, and develop interior decoration, which I was rather interested in. But by the time I got to 21, I was still feeling this sort of bug about acting on the stage and so on. And I remember one day an actor who I admired tremendously said, uh, I, I was chatting to him and I was sort of admiring his ideas and so on and so forth. And he said, uh, I said, you know, it's, I feel so much like an old man. And he said, what do you mean you're only 21? He said, you could go to RADA. I said, I thought so I could. I decided then to take an audition, which I passed. And... Um, the director of RADA at the time allowed me to get in rather quickly. But I think by that time I was too much of a businessman mm. to enjoy being a student. And I didn't like being a student at all. And when this opportunity was presented again to rejoin the family business in records, I was rather attracted by it because it still had, I suppose, a bit of a mm. glamour of the theatre and stage left. And I thought that it would be the best thing and I enjoyed this very much indeed. I found I liked working in records as much in classical as, as in pops. What, what sort of musical interests had you had while you were at school? Were you interested in music then? Yes, I was taught to play the violin, and I was very interested in classical music. I used to go to a lot of concerts in Liverpool, and um, I, I didn't really have a lot of time for pops until I was very much in the record business. Mm. I, mean, I mean the retail side. Yes. And I used to go and see a lot of pop shows and packages and so on. The musical interests you had, do they make you feel that um, the sort of music you are handling now is worthwhile? In other words, I'm saying, do you think that modern pop is, is good music? I don't know about it being good music, but it's an art form anyway. An art form? You pitch it as high as that? Yes, you? Mm -hmm. yes. Do you know enough about music to have an, any say in the actual... Uh, composition or recording or arrangement of numbers? I don't know about music, but I know about... I think I know about hit songs, hit numbers, hit sounds. Uh, is there anyone in the recording studios with whom you might possibly clash over this sort of issue? George Martin is the uh, Beatles and many of my other artists' recording manager. Uh, but we get on extremely well, fortunately, and we work very closely on what is recorded. Once titles are decided upon, uh, the rest is really left to him. I sit in on a lot of sessions and so on, uh, and I'll say what I think about various records and what sides should be issued, but uh, he makes the recordings. I I'm not a technical person at all. You get on very well with him. Do you get on very well with a lot of people? On the whole, yes. Uh, obviously one gets on well with people unless one doesn't like them. Yes, but do you go out of your way to get on well with people? Yes. In this peculiar business, the world of the impresario, you still seem to me to be a strange fish in a very weird sort of sea. Do you get on well with the impresarios you have to mix with? On the whole, I think so. Um, there may be quite a lot of envy about... Uh, and I'm aware of that, and it's for that reason that I think that it's up to me to try personally to make up mm -hmm. for that envy, because it isn't a nice thing for other people to feel particularly. But if I was envious of somebody um, who was doing sort of something that I admired and wished that I could do, I'd be very envious and almost irritated if he was a bit nasty to me. But if he was a nice chap... Uh, or sort of was always pleasant and courteous and good to talk to and so on, to me, then I'd just envy him with admiration and pleasure. Mm -hmm. Is your relationship with your artists an unusual one, would you say? In, in I think so, yes. I think it's a fairly personal one for uh, considering that I act in the role of uh, manager and agent. A lot of uh, pop singers and so on have, have a manager and an agent, to whom, by the way, they pay separate percentages. Mm -hmm. What are the pleasures of management, then? What kick do you get out of it? Uh, lots. The development of an artist, uh,
to a certain extent, I suppose there must be something in the actual dependence of an artist, which is very gratifying in a way. Yeah. Uh, and, and their tremendous loyalty. Um, and also, I like my artists as people very much. I think they're all great people, and I really mean that. Uh, it was recently written about me that I probably enjoy best the company of my artists. I think it's quite true, actually, because it was written in a context where I don't have uh, much of a social life and that most of my time is spent with my artists. Well, apart from a general feeling of pleasure, is there any specific moment in management when you really get a kick? Have you had a, a, a real kick out of any aspect of management lately? Well, you always get a kick when a record comes into the hit frame or a record hits number one. That's, that is a great feeling. It's, it's a simple thing, really. But it's a great feeling, because you, you've been right. The artist's been right, and you've been right. The recording manager's been right. The song was right. The yeah. artist was right. And it was put over in the right way. And one feels that all one's work has sort of suddenly been worthwhile. It's just like, I suppose, winning a race. It's, just the, it's not just the record and the artist and the song getting to number one. But so much happens because a record has hit number one. An artist is suddenly important and they're wanted everywhere because the record looks as though it's going to be number one in other parts of the world. It all, the, 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 a record in the charts means a great deal to an artist in this day and age. Was uh, there an immense amount of pre-planning in that American trip? When did you start thinking about it, for example? Well, obviously one's thought about America uh, in connection with the Beatles for a long time because I always thought... I was always quite sure, that really, that the Beatles would make it big over there. I was... We were all rather perturbed about it because nothing... We seemed to be issuing the records and nothing much was happening. And I went over... Uh, a, to have a look around and see why and try and sense the American market. I also took with me um, one of my own artists, Billy J. Kramer, um, to do some promotional work, which I thought would be a, a good idea. And both worked quite well, actually. So far as sort of looking around and seeing what was the matter, uh, I think that it was it was very simple. My, my answer um, to the boys when I came, I was I didn't think that we'd yet produced a record which was right for the American market. But I did think, having listened to an awful lot of American pop music and what was currently popular over there, that I want to hold your hand which was just about to be issued, was the right one. Plus the fact that an awful lot of information had filtered through from the British press, from the Royal Command and the Palladium and the scenes in London and Beatlemania, as it's called, in general. Uh, there was great interest at that stage, and it was just the right moment for the issue of what I want to hold your hand. Timing seems to come into this somewhere. Um, was the American trip... A su such a success because it was perfectly timed, or what? I think that it helped tremendously. Uh, I didn't... I'm, I couldn't possibly say that I timed that because I knew it would be exactly right, but it, it, it was right, as it happens. That Ed Sullivan... Those, going over at that particular moment for those two Ed Sullivan shows could not have been more right. The records were just at the top. They'd been at the top for a couple of weeks, and they were still at the top. And it fitted in very well indeed. There's another venture on the stocks now, and again, timing may have come into this. You're making a film. Yes. A, a conscious, deliberate decision, or have other people persuaded you to do it? Well, we've had film offers, obviously, since the boys uh, first started to have big hits over here. Um, a lot of them we didn't like, and... I w did start to get perturbed because obviously films were important and I think that the Beatles are going to be very good in films. The thing which really started off this film, I think, was the idea of Alan Owen. Um, because the Beatles were very keen about this and so was I. I thought that he was an excellent writer and the right person for this film. Are you involved in producing this film at all? Slightly, yes. Um, in, in, in an, advi an advisory capacity, but uh, I've taken a, it upon myself to produce Jerry and the Pacemakers film. Aren't you ever timid about going into new areas, highly technical areas like this, without a great deal of knowledge or experience? Not really, because one studies quite a lot uh, from an outsider's point of view. And after all, I'd, I'd 
started to manage the Beatles and the others without any experience at all. How long, looking further ahead in the future, is it going to be before the sort of noise the Beatles make is out of fashion? It does seem to me that generally there's a slight sort of change even now uh, in a general trend. But I don't basically believe in trends in pop music. I think that... I and mean, what's Cilla Black got to do with, say, the Mersey sound or the beat sound or anything like that? What are these slight signs of the change that you detect in pop music at the moment? I think that the, that the heavy uh, beat, the pounding beat, is lessening the popularity of it. And I think that there's a, that there's, um, a more subtle sort of sound coming, which is uh, rather nice, I think. It's rather good, uh, and good harmony, too. What sort of examples? Uh, well, discounting anybody that I have anything to do with, uh, I'd say that the searchers are a very good example of what I think is, is a coming sound for the next few months. I think they're a very good group, actually. The Mersey sound, this phrase I gather you don't like, uh, was, of course, coined presumably by newspaper men because of the crop of groups coming from the yes. Liverpool area. I, I found it a peg to hang with yeah. them. Uh, it, the Liverpool area seemed to give the movement some sort of strength, but you yourself have now just moved down to London. Isn't this a mistake? Yes. It's a pity. We've, I've moved with great reluctance, actually, because I like Liverpool and I like its people, and obviously uh, I probably owe the city... Uh, quite a lot. But the trouble was that it was becoming almost impossible to organise um, my own life uh, and do the best that I could for the artists, um, sort of moving between Liverpool and London. So much has to be done in London. The artists uh, perform so often, and they make their records in London and so on and so forth, uh, that... I suppose that one was forced into it. I'm not terribly unhappy about it. It's it's sad in a way, I suppose, but it doesn't really mean that we think any less of Liverpool or we want to be less in Liverpool. My home is in Liverpool, and uh, I intend to return there as much as I can. But it may have an effect on this talent-spotting um, ability of yours, may, mayn't it, if you're taken right out of this Liverpool area, where so many groups are just beginning... Yes, this is something that slightly worries me because uh, I used to be around ballrooms and clubs very much more than I am now um, because I seem to be involved in heavy business conferences all the time. But I hope I, I shall try um, very consciously to avoid being away from it all because it's the part of the business which I enjoy. I'd much rather go to a ballroom and watch groups and people during an evening than um, sit having a heavy dinner discussing something which probably won't come off anyway. <laughs> this, this managing bit, managing the artist, what, what does a manager do for the artist? Let's assume the Beatles, four bright boys, one, one is told. Yes. Why couldn't they cope with these sort of things themselves? Well, they wouldn't be bothered to do so anyway, as they are at, at present. But do you mean as, as they are at present, or do you mean as they were two and a half years ago? Well, let's take them as two separate things. From uh, two and a half years ago, could they have got themselves to where they are now without... No, I don't think they would have bothered. They were, they were playing around the clubs in Liverpool and having great fun. But I don't think that they would have bothered to do anything about it, and they may not have done it in the right way. Because young, inexperienced people from a business point of view are not really very good at presenting themselves properly in the right sort of quarters and so on. Also, one advised them on a lot of things. You look after their business affairs, but the, the degree of management or work that you can do on an artist, to a certain extent, depends upon, I would say, on the personal relationship between manager and artist. Mm -hmm. I do quite a, a great deal for all of them. But this is because there's a strong sort of personal link. Right, now then, let's consider the Beatles as they are now, the position they are now. Do they really need a manager for future development? I would say that they need a manager 
more now than ever because there's so much work involved in what we call the management, uh, one could say the organisation of the Beatles, that they couldn't possibly do it for themselves. Do they need you as a manager? Or have they got to a stage now where anybody could manage them who knew the technical side of the thing? I don't think that anybody could manage them because I don't think that the Beatles would, would be managed by anyone else. Is it this personal relationship? I don't know whether I should be saying that, actually, but uh, I think that it's true. Do you get much satisfaction from the sense of power uh, running this organisation may give you? No, and I don't feel it particularly, because, uh, well, I suppose it could be said that uh, ha sort of controlling human beings is a powerful thing, but I don't think of it as such. Well, I try not. I don't, I, no, I don't even try not to. I just don't. Are you, in your own opinion, a particularly good businessman? Fair. As a businessman, fair. I, I, I've got a business background and uh, probably a, a reasonable business brain. I'm no, I'm no sort of genius. <laughs> what are your defects, then? Why aren't you um, better than you apparently think you are? I'm probably sort of too conscious of ideas rather than um, finance behind ideas. Do you think the RADA episode unsettled you at all from pure business? No, I think it was a very good thing, well, even though I didn't actually like being a student. Uh, it, was a, it was a very good thing. One learned a great deal. It was quite interesting, as a matter of fact. I've often thought that uh, I realised about acting and RADA about six months after I'd left RADA. Were you any good as an actor? Not at the time. I like to think that I may have been. Has it left you with a, a, a distaste for or a real taste for theatre? A real taste for theatre. Real theatre? Yes, very much so. I would, I would like so much to produce and, <laughs> dare I say it, act in a, sh um, a play, a what, straight play. What sort of plays? Possibly something by Chekhov or a modern straight drama. What sort of dramatist? Uh, I don't know. Osborne? Something that one knows about. You've come in to this business from most unusual surroundings and circumstances, Mr. Epstein. An enormous number of things have happened to you and the people you're working with in the last two and a half years. Could you envisage a different sort of life from the one you're leading now? No, certainly not. Um, I'd like to develop the work that I'm doing in that I, I, in, in, uh, I look forward with pleasure to films and presenting shows and possibly getting to the legit side. But this is certainly the work that I like best. And never back to the family business? I don't think so. To America in order to um, fish around to see to arrange bookings and so on and so forth. Uh, I pay my own fares. I can, if, if I contract um, the Beatles to, say, the Ed Sullivan show, he'll pay fares for the boys and possibly their road managers, mm -hmm. but I don't consider that I can, uh, that he should pay my fare because I don't strictly travel with them wherever they go. So wherever I go, I have to pay my own expenses, and that all comes out of that 25%. Plus, of course, uh, for that 25%, we... Um, arrange for them to have all their photographs, we arrange their transport, and the, you can imagine the telephone calls that we make on behalf mm -hmm. of, say, the Beatles, which is sort of worldwide, really. Mm. Immense telephone bills. Tremendous, yes. Well, it seems a funny sort of world for a young man like you to be in. How did you get... Mr. Epstein, the Beatles have tended to overshadow all the other artists you have... Uh, working for you or for whom you work. What sort of size of empire have you got now? Um, we have seven acts. I call them acts because five of those are groups and two of them are soloists. That's um, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, which is a separate entity, his backing group, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Tommy Quickly, the foremost, Scylla Black, 
and Sounds Incorporated. And what about the administrative staff to support all this? What well, it varies slightly because um, we've just moved into London mm -hmm. and we're gathering new staff, but um, it's approximately 25. What sort of size of empire is it in terms of money? One's read some staggering figures that the Beatles have earned for their recording company mm. last year. What sort of turnover does this empire produce? I couldn't give you an answer to that. I really don't know. Because don't forget that the company has only... The companies which can uh, manage these artists, to which they are contracted, has only been in operation for June... since June 1962. Mm -hmm. The papers have been... A accusing you of being Mr. 25%. If the turnover is as big as we were implying then, this means a very large income from you. Is it, in fact, a lot in the entertainment business? It isn't. It isn't. And uh, one's profits from that 25% in this business are not really fantastic because my own personal expenses in connection with the management of artists are quite fantastic, really. What sort of expenses are those? Well, when I fly to America, or I fly... Get into it. How did you start? I started uh, whilst I was in charge of the records division of a family concern of which I was and am, as it was still a director. Uh, we were asked, or I was asked, by a young boy for a record by a group by the Beatles. And it always had been our policy in records to look after whatever request was made. And I followed up this inquiry. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and it was only after a week or two that he told me that they were, in fact, a Liverpool group. I, I assumed, for some reason, that they were from Germany. Mm. Anyway, he told me that they were a Liverpool group and that they'd just, in fact, returned from Germany and that they were playing in a club called The Cavern, uh, about 100 yards away from my office. And I arranged to go down there and I saw them one midday session, which is a pretty, and at the time it was a pretty, uh, pretty much of an eye-opener to go down into this darkened, yes. dank, smoky cellar in the middle of the day uh, and to see crowds and crowds of kids watching these four um, young men on stage. They were sort of f rather scruffily dressed mm. in, in the nicest possible way, or I should say in, in the most attractive way. Mm -hmm. Um, black leather jackets and jeans, uh, long hair, of course, and a uh, rather untidy stage presentation, not terribly aware and not caring very much what they, s what they looked like. I think they cared more even then what they sounded like. Mm. I think they still care more what they sound like. Jeffrey Giuliano is the author of some 30 internationally best-selling books on the Beatles, John Lennon, and other iconic musicians of the 1960s. In 2006, his book, Paint It Black, The Murder of Brian Jones, was made into a film by Stephen Woolley and Nick Powell entitled Stoned, The Wild and Wicked World of Brian Jones. It remains a cult classic and the only film bio of the Rolling Stones. Giuliano is also a veteran journalist, having written for dozens of high-profile newspapers and magazines, including The Sunday People, The Daily Mail, The News of the World, The Mail on Sunday, Playgirl, and Rolling Stone. A noted film actor, Giuliano starred in such movies as Vikingdom, Scorpion King 3, Jules Verne's The Mysterious Island, The Fifth Execution, Far Cry 3, Firefire Fire Desire, among many. In addition, he hosted the long-running North American syndicated radio series, Jeffrey Giuliano's Roots of Rock, for five years, as well as pioneering the audiobook industry in the 1990s by authoring, narrating, and producing over 250 original, non-book-based, interview-driven productions. Giuliano's publishers included Random House, HarperCollins, Delta Entertainment, Dirk and Hayes, Playaway Audio, Speechworks, and B&B &B Audio, among dozens more internationally. In 1998, Random House acquired his firm Tribute Audio, for which Giuliano acted as CEO and publisher for five years. His best-selling audiobook, That Fateful Night, True Stories of Titanic Survivors in Their Own Words, was nominated for a Grammy. 
In 2014, Jeffrey Giuliano founded Icon Editions and G2 Media Arts to market his updated works as well as publish new projects. As a visual artist, Jeffrey has been showing in galleries across America since 1977, garnering impressive reviews. His first professional assignment was designing several T-shirts for the Who's Pete Townsend in 1976. Jeffrey also designed and illustrated many of his original rock biographies for the biggest publishers in the world from 1984 to 2006, as well as designing for his pioneering record label Samba Records in the mid 1990s. From 2006 to 2011, Jeffrey was also the primary designer for the French fashion house Cotai. When Giuliano first conceived of creating his own literary imprint, Icon Editions, he became responsible for illustrating and designing 35 book covers, several hundred CDs, DVDs, as well as dozens of promotional posters, and eventually an entire collection of exclusive fashion and art. The expansive design by Giuliano brand grew out of Jeffrey's impressive commitment to the arts and is the culmination of a lifetime's work by an extraordinarily talented and determined Renaissance man.